Greetings, ladies and gentle colts. Special offer. This lovely background image, in your choice of colors, can be yours for a $3 donation to Patreon or Ko-fi made by August 8th, 2017. We're not counting time zones, don't worry. Hello, I'm Beast. I mean Lux. <laughs> and I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Disney's live-action Beauty and the Beast film. I liked it. It was very enjoyable. I liked how they changed things up. I was really worried they were going to keep it too much the same. I was really afraid it was just going to be shot for shot the animated film. Yeah, but they took the highlights and made sure those were in the film. But everything else they changed slightly. Not just by casting people differently in the roles, but also by writing the roles slightly differently, like making LeFleu a very sympathetic character. Yes, instead of keeping him as he is in Disney's initial animated Beauty and the Beast, he is more similar to the sycophants in other Disney live-action films, like their live-action Snow White, or their earlier foray into live-action fairy tale movies, Enchanted. And the sycophant changing sides, or at least being sympathetic, is rather a long-standing tradition overall in the live-action Frog Prince by Canon Films. The female entourage of the snotty princess played by Helen Hunt helps the heroine princess by giving her a map. Yeah. I also like how they handled Gaston. He came off better at the start. Than the animated one. The animated one, you were instantly, yeah, I'm gonna hate this guy. This one, you got time to build up your, oh god, he definitely, yeah, most definitely a jerk. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you actually see his descent, so you have this nice contrast, because you see Gaston's descent from jerk to total jerk, while you see the beast's ascendance from lousy no good kidnapper to someone worthy of love mm -hmm. yeah i also like the interactions between bell and gaston in this one because you can tell they've interacted before the movie yeah there's definitely a history there where with the animated one it's like she's had no interaction at all and bell is more aware during the bonjour song of people's reactions you don't see her just blindly dodging people she's truly taking in what they're saying and reacting to it where in the animated version she has her nose in the book the whole time she is only as aware of her surroundings as she needs to be to not run into someone they definitely handled a lot of this movie better than the original and just the little tweaks they've done like how they've given Belle more agency they've made her more of a solid character they had to add some of the more modern stuff into the story about how we see women how they can be anything but i also like how they kept it in that time period she was in so they also had the people who reacted badly to that yes and reacting badly to bell's behavior in the village also their house is right in the village in the original they were set off away from the village so she truly can't get away so all the more reason to escape into the books also a nice change in her father's abilities you know instead of just working on crazy inventions and everyone always thinks that maurice is crazy old maurice no he does clockworks and can paint and a highly skilled artisan and then you have Belle's creativity of taking what she's learned of her father's work and applying it to her everyday life. That was a brilliant idea for clothes washing. Mm-hmm. That was really awesome. Yes, and then the villager is very deliberately picking on her in that moment. It's like, okay, I immediately lost all sympathy for 90% of the village at that point. So it's like, okay, I don't like any of you anymore. Oh, yeah, most of them. If you notice, the librarian was helping her pick up clothes. Yes. Well, obviously, he's the librarian. And so, so less books than in the other, in the animation. And also, 
one of the changes there, he doesn't give her the book. She still is just borrowing it. And they skip that whole thing of, oh, but you've already read it twice. Hmm. Have you gotten anything new? Not since yesterday. That's all right. I'll borrow this one. That one? But you've read it twice. I know, but it's my favorite. Uh, I think also making the library smaller gave the impact of Beast's library a bigger impact. It's kind of like if you walked into the library of Alexandria. I'd never come out. I would be like that researcher in Avatar who doesn't leave the library. That would be me. Yeah, I'd be like, it. it's work day. You have work? One more book. But you have work. <laughs> There's one more book here I want to read, though. You can borrow it. They have a checkout policy. <laughs> Actually, probably like, one more scroll. But they... I, they uh, because it is a library of Alexandria, so it would probably be mostly scrolls. I don't know if they had any bound books in that library. It's hard for us to tell. We just know it was huge. But back to the movie. Yes, and a lot of costuming changes, because the three girls who are constantly swooning over Gaston are now all dressed alike instead of just being recolors of each other. And we skipped a few things... In the visuals of the Bonjour song, a woman who goes on about, it's no wonder her name means beauty, her looks have no parallel, she's not bald in this. Also, Gaston and LeFou's dialogue, when they're first introduced during the song, is different. And it doesn't start with them hunting. Hmm. His first singing lines are the same, but the dialogue is different. And we also have more information about Gaston, that he was a captain, he fought in wars. Now, which war are they referring to? Well, they're in France, so... We'll have to look up the approximate time period. Hmm, interesting. And speaking of the songs, what did you think of them? Very nicely rendered. I don't know the musical score well enough, meaning the Broadway musical, to know if all of the songs I didn't recognize very well were pulled from... The musical. I know Home is from the musical, but the only other songs I'm familiar with, thanks to my classic Disney combos, from the Broadway musical production are Human Again and If I Can't Love Her. Might be If I Can't Have Her, just in case I'm wrong. I've never seen the musical either, but it felt a lot like it took a lot of influences from that. I think it did, because... Back when I used to see more morning television, a lot of the musicals would come on the morning shows and play one number. So I have seen Gaston's number from the musical. Hmm. So what do you think of the changes to the songs you do know? It flowed rather well. The, the changes to Gaston's song were fun. You know, pointing out the fact that, yeah, LeFou would be illiterate and incapable of spelling. Mm-hmm. I also love the fact that if you notice carefully, he's paying off everyone as the song goes on. He's constantly dropping coins to people. Yeah, it's not just them all supporting. It's here, play the music, here, get involved. Mm-hmm. Here, I'm buying you a drink, keep going. Mm-hmm. And really rallying them and doing this as Gaston's lackey. Mm-hmm. But I also like the part where Gaston kind of points out like, yeah, I'm coming up with all these rhymes, basically. Yeah, a little bit of self-awareness of, I keep coming up with all these refrains. Yes, because the song just keeps going. Because I'm pretty sure this version's longer. And changes to who sings what parts, not just in this song, but also in the Kill the Beast song. If you listen, some of the male and female parts are changed. Also interesting that there were women in the mob in the live action. It was mostly the men in the animated version. Hmm. I also just like the feel overall of the musical numbers. They feel different. That's what I was hoping for. I was like, I want the feel of the original musical songs, but I want them to be different. I want things changed about them that make sense, not just changing them for change's sake. 
but doing things that actually make sense and fixing things canonically, like the enchantress making the village forget about the castle. Because the castle's too close to the village, there's no way the village wouldn't know about the castle. And having people who are in the village who had connections to the castle, because that's also how things work. Because the castle usually gets its staff from the nearby village. So you have family members, you have friends, you have people who know each other, and the village would have been making deliveries to the castle. You know, even if there wasn't a direct connection, like we had several families that were actually split up because of what the Enchantress did. I'd like to know if the Enchantress took that into account when she cast her curse, because she was affecting more than just the beast. So you have to think, did the staff deserve the punishment because they didn't rebel against the prince's excessive ways, because they didn't step in and stand up for the prince when he was a child and started to be turned sour by the king after the death of the queen. Mm -hmm. That's another nice connection between Belle and the Beast. Both their mothers died. Yes, it's nice that they can be orphans together. No, I meant it's another story connection. It's nice that that is there. We had like no real backstory on the Beast in the original other than he was a brat, he got cursed, oh well. Pretty much. And we didn't have much on Belle except she doesn't fit in, which means she wasn't born in the town. Obviously, they were relative newcomers. But at this point, we know they're not relative newcomers because Maurice took Belle when she was still an infant. So there was probably a lag between when he left and when he settled down, but Belle would have still been very, very young when they came to settle in the village. It's a very nice movie. <laughs> It definitely has the feel of the original, too, but it has those differences we were hoping for. Yes, unlike Maleficent, which goes clear off in another direction, and unlike Snow White, which has nothing in common with Disney's animated Snow White, I can't speak to the live-action Cinderella because I didn't watch it yet. And I haven't seen Maleficent yet, either. But I can see where people had issues with it, as a lot of the dialogue between Mrs. Potts and Belle felt just like they were putting it in to keep this from having everyone yell, Hey, Stockholm Syndrome! Which is kind of a classic failing of Beauty and the Beast. Well, when it was written, they didn't really have the concept of Stockholm Syndrome. Yes, also women were property, so what did it matter that she was a prisoner? Though I think they handled that a little bit better, not just the dialogue with Mrs. Potts, but the fact that the way Belle chooses to be a prisoner this time, compared to, I'm going to exchange myself, Beast puts her away. This is her literally going, Father, go, kick. Yeah. Well, she offers to exchange herself. Her father says no, and she's like, okay, fine. <laughs> so it shows a lot more sacrifice on the part of both of them. Because her father refuses to allow her to do it, and Belle refuses to allow him to not let her do it. Also, this goes more back to the classic roots, Maurice was imprisoned for stealing the rose. That isn't why he was imprisoned in the animated version. He didn't steal the rose. He was there being tended to by the staff, and the beast had a fit. Also, he freaked out much more reasonably, because Maurice in the animated version just rolled with it. Mm-hmm. I love the, oh, thank you so much. Though that was kind of a, like, hmm. I would question that myself. But says, oh, thank you. Starts eating, and then his eyes just go wide as the cup starts moving towards him. And the cup says, I was told not to move. It might frighten you. Thank you. I'm out of here. <laughs> Yes, but still you also have, even in the midst of his fear, he's still thinking of his daughter because he stops to get the rose for Belle. And it's so sweet that she asks for a rose like the one in the picture every year, but all things considered, I think I'd ask for a book every year. <laughs> he is going to a different town, which apparently he, like, got lost. I couldn't quite understand if he got lost on his way there or his way back. His way there, because when Belle takes Philippe to go find him, and you find the wreckage of the carriage, the clockwork that he had built was spilled out onto the ground. 
he wouldn't still have the clockwork if he was on his way back. Ah, good point. Because if he'd made it there, he would have had the rose. Because he would have been on his way back. Hmm. Unless for some reason he couldn't get the rose. Which is more how the story goes traditionally. The reason I bring that up is because I'm wondering, it's like, so how did he get lost on the way out if he's apparently traveled it quite often? He has traveled it quite often. But Agatha's been in the town the whole time. Did she do anything to get Maurice to the castle? Which would eventually bring Belle to the castle. Because she's been there silent in the town this whole time. Also, if she's been in the town the whole time, where was Gaston's comeuppance? Yeah. Maybe she saw good in the beast's heart and had to do this to get it out. But she saw no good in Gaston's heart. Yeah, and Gaston was a lost cause. Well, why not just deal with him sooner? Well, maybe this was her plan all along. <laughs> it could be. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Because that's another different touch. You could obviously see the sorceress still there the entire time. Yes. And she does intervene because she saves Maurice. Mm-hmm. Talk about dedication to one's spells. Yeah, she didn't just cast it and run off. She's been keeping an eye on the village and, incidentally, the castle the whole time. Also, maybe it was her way of taking care of the entire village, even though the village was kind of somebody being punished and probably was full of a lot of innocent people when the curse happened. Maybe it was actually going downhill, especially since it was being taxed to death. And this was her way of setting the whole situation right. Yeah, because they're not having to pay the taxes, and so they were left on their own to be able to develop. But now that they have a proper ruler back, they should be able to flourish even more. Yes, because the castle provides income to the village and also provides protection. You know, villages can't afford to field armies or even large patrols to go take care of bandits. So any highlights you'd like to go over? The use of the sorceress's book as a literal escape. Mm. Because Belle talks about books being an escape and a journey, and the Beast has one that does so literally. Also gives us the opportunity to get the canonical answer of what happened to Belle's mother. Mm -hmm. The plague. And I like how they reveal that, because the Beast would know about it, because he has a really high education, so he was able to see the Doctor's Mask and go, ooh, shoot. Especially that specific style of Doctor's Mask. Yes. So he knows exactly what happened because he sees that mask. And that's another thing, is you know the Beast of the Animated One is so uncouth and barbaric. It's like he doesn't know anything. This Beast is highly educated. He's just a heartless jerk. Also, a nice change in how Belle goes from using a spoon to sipping from the bowl. That was porridge in the animated. This was red. Much more shocking to see that red against his fur than the porridge up against his face. This is going back to um, the designs of the character, specifically the objects, the servants. At first, when I saw stills, I was like, hmm... I was okay with Cogsworth and Mrs. Potts, but something about Lumiere kind of drew me off at first. But when I saw it in motion, I liked them a lot better. Well, if you look at the animated version, it makes more use of the wax in conveying his expressions. Where with the live action, he's truly more of the metal. And it did look and feel somewhat awkward to me. But when they talked about what the curse was doing, making them less and less human, and we're towards the end, it kind of makes sense that it feels stilted and off. And I just remembered these little touches they were like throwing in, like how that one guy liked how he was dressed after that one attack where the Three Musketeers, as they were called in the movie. Yes, how uh, the wardrobe gave them all uh, cross-dress makeovers and one of them liked it. And he also looked very dapper at the end when he was at the dance mm -hmm. and cut in on LeFou. Mm -hmm. Well, cut in to be with LeFou. Yeah, and they seemed to kind of like each other, which I remember hearing about a gay couple in this movie. I'm like, really? Oh, you mean a little hint at the end? That's not that big. I watch Steven Universe. <laughs> 
Yeah, people like to put a lot of emphasis on small things. Yeah, because a lot of people see Disney as this ultimate family company that can't be edgy. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, this was still very safe for Disney. I mean, they used to play these kind of jokes all the time in the old animation. If you go back to the older animation, especially all the rubber hose Mickey Mouse style stuff, uh, Mickey's a jerk. You know, all this wholesome stuff didn't come around till later. Hmm. So we've talked a lot about what we did like, so what didn't we like? <laughs> uh, I know we had to have a heavy reliance on special effects and it handle it for the animate objects. There's kind of no real help for that other than extreme puppetry, which would have been much more difficult and probably would have taken a lot longer and the effects wouldn't have come out. And cost more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really nice puppetry is kind of becoming a lost art. Uh, the CG wolves. It's like, I know that this way you don't have to worry about animals getting hurt. You only had to have real horses and real chickens. And Disney's usually better than that with animal animations. Uh, the wolves just really felt off to me. I've seen a lot lately with a lot of movies that have CG effects in it. I've noticed there's some scenes that, wow, that was CG. And then you hit these other scenes where you're like, oh my god, CG. Yeah, and for me, everything with the wolves just felt off. They, they stood out a lot. They didn't quite feel like they were actually there. No, they didn't. And their movements weren't quite right for a wolf pack. Which is really strange for Disney, because Disney usually brings in live animals for the animators to study so that they can get the movements and the behaviors and the subtleties. And speaking of animals and special effects, what did you think of the beast? Nice design. I could see why people might be upset because of how much it deviates from the animated version. But he's still a beast. I thought the horns were kind of a nice accent. I see where people would be like, oh, it makes him more devilish. Or, you know, it's not canonical because this wasn't in the original movie. Yeah. Remember the part at the beginning? Based on. That means there's variances. I was more upset that Philippe was changed from a brown plow horse to a white cart horse. Though I just remembered another point I wanted to bring up all the way back at the beginning of the movie. The corrections to the story. I think you brought this up before, but I really like how they changed specifically one set of lines. They removed the age and just said, until the rose dies, basically. Yeah, so there was no until his 21st birthday. It was just until the rose died. And we see under the curse, nobody aged. Because the prince in this version was cursed as an adult, which means nobody ages. Which makes more sense because Chip was a child of under 10 years. And in the movie, the animated movie, they specifically say 10 years we've been rusting, needing so much more than dusting. Chip was definitely under 10. The implications of that if everyone was naturally aging do not bear thinking about. But Disney went back in the animated and canonically made the prince a child, which means everyone should have aged. So the only reason there that makes any sense is because the servants were turned into inanimate objects which can deteriorate but don't actually age and you could very clearly see the age differences at the end like when mr and mrs potts got back together and when cogsworth got assaulted by his wife mm -hmm. which apparently he's not too fond of i love the turn back into a clock turn back into a clock <laughs> yes and also talking about the time frame, because you mentioned, you know, the rose until it died as opposed to his 21st year. They also altered the lines in Be Our Guest. When Lumiere is talking about how long it's been, he just says, for so long. They don't give an amount of time that they've been cursed. They did a lot to correct that part of the story. Especially since in the animated version, they also got the fact that he was a young boy when he got cursed, but there was an adult picture of him. Hmm. <laughs> yes, and how off all of that is, because a young boy shouldn't have been answering the door at night when his parents are at home. Hmm. Well, that brings up the fact that I want to now go and watch everything wrong with. 
because I saw the one for the original animation. I want to see the one for this, because no movie is perfect. Nope. But sometimes it's painful to watch those, especially if it's a movie you really loved. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else we should go over, or should we start wrapping up our thoughts on this? Oh, I, I'm not done nitpicking Gaston's behavior. Ah, please continue then. Well, with the Kill the Beast song, how he's talking about, at moments like this, they're all mine. I can get them to do anything I want. So he's a good manipulator. Hmm. Because he managed to turn the people against Maurice, then against Belle and the Beast, and riled them up into a mob, obedient to him. Mm-hmm. That probably also explains how he worked in the military. Yes. That's why he was a captain. He could get his unit to do what he wanted. Mm-hmm. I also like the line from LeFou in that song. I think we unleashed the wrong beast, basically. Yeah, basically, here we're doing this, but uh, I think we all we did was release other monsters. Because that's the thing, is you get to see LeFou progressing. You know, he's aligned himself with Gaston for a very long time, which is a common thing. You know, sometimes those who are less popular or perhaps have less natural talent or believe that they don't attach themselves to someone stronger who gives them place and a purpose. And over the course of the events, because that's part of what we see is we're seeing it through LeFou's eyes that Gaston's behavior has gone down because LeFou goes from being unquestioning to having to make difficult moral decisions because he lies and you know goes against Maurice in order to keep Gaston but then you have the final betrayal at the castle and LeFou changes sides though I also like the part where Gaston and LeFou are talking and Gaston's like yeah you're this great guy I'm like yeah he makes a great wife <laughs> and the whole so why haven't you been snatched up? Well, I've been told I'm too clingy. I'm like, seriously, you were clinging to Gaston. Even during the song, you guys get really close. And it's like, too much? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I like the reaction from Gaston at that particular moment. He says, I've been told I'm too clingy. And Gaston thinks for a moment, goes, mm-hmm, kind of starts backing away. <laughs> he does that little slight shift to the other side. Body language. It's important when you're acting. Yes. Well, it's important. When you're talking to other people, too. So. Yes, a great deal of what we figure out are from nonverbal cues. Mm -hmm. And just Gaston in the movie also had more reasons for pursuing Belle than Gaston in the animated. Because Gaston in the animated, it was just like, she's the most beautiful, therefore she's the best, and I deserve the best. He was interested in her not only because she was beautiful, but because she was a challenge. And ever since... You know, war's over, peacetime, there has not been enough excitement in his life. The going up and matching wits with Belle was the closest he was getting to combat. Okay, so if she had capitulated and you married her, would you have expected that to continue? Would you expect that you just won that one battle, she agreed to marry you, but everything else is going to hell? Or would you expect that she would now be subservient to you in all things? And therefore, you wouldn't you lose interest if the whole point was the challenge? Hmm. That was also another scene shift. Gaston never made it into Belle's cottage. He didn't call the village folk there to witness the wedding. Well, he went in and made the joke of, oh, just one last thing, gotta go ask the girl. And his whole scenario of how his wife would be rubbing his feet and the children would be there playing... That conversation in the animated feature was in Belle's cottage, to Belle. Mm. Here, it was in the tavern. To LeFou. Mm-hmm. Who was rubbing his shoulders. So LeFou was filling many of the needs of Gaston in the supporter role. I love how you describe things and how you pick these things out of the movie. It's awesome. Yeah, and then going back to the beginning, the prince's extravagance with that dance. Also, it was all girls. Yeah, I think it was a suitor dance if you listen to the song. I think he actually specifically that night brought a bunch of girls to see 
who he'd marry. That or his father did. I don't know if the father was still alive in that particular scene. Hard to say because they don't really touch on that. But I think the scene itself was set up to be a courtship ceremony and that works even better for the story because that gets interrupted. Because the singer is describing how all these girls are hoping he'll look at them, which makes sense. The only thing is, there should, even for a courtship dance, still have been male chaperones. Hmm. Or older female chaperones. You do not let your marriageable daughter go somewhere unchaperoned. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely like the way they handled so much more of this movie. I, I enjoyed their original. But this one I enjoyed just as much, I would say. Yeah, which watching this one as an adult and still technically being a minor when the first one came out, different perspective. Also, I've seen Red, etc. How many versions of Beauty and the Beast? Because I have Beauty, Rose Daughter, and the Fire Rose. Hmm. Did you watch the TV series? Yes. Wasn't it awesome? Yes. It was a good one. I like how they handled that. I even watched a little bit of the modern remake. Not much because it was on actual television. Hmm. I've never seen that one. I guess I have to do a little internet searching later. And it was also nice that Belle and her father escaped themselves, not Chip went down to the village and used Maurice's crazy invention to bust them out of a cellar. Yeah, that was a nice touch. And I like how they go back to the scene when he was working on the clock. Yeah, it was like, oh, yeah, it's just cogs and gears. I should be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And then she pulls a hair thing out before he even asks for it. Mm -hmm. Going back to knowing each other so well that not just that she knows him, but that she knows the work that he's doing and understands it to the point where she can anticipate what's needed. Including a gear, which he was like, oh, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, yeah, that actually is. <laughs> yes. Though I wonder if he had a specific buyer for that clockwork piece, or if he was just making it to sell in general. Because if you look at the imagery, that's him painting the painting of his wife, who's sitting there posing for it. I think it's even the tower they were living in. Right. So... Would there have been anyone who would have commissioned that specific piece for him? Was it a general commission piece of, oh, I want a clockwork tower with moving people? Or was it just something that he wanted to make and he knows that the clockworks will sell? Especially with that much work being put into it for a high price. Mm-hmm. Because craftsmanship like that does not come cheaply, especially in the pre-mechanized era. Mm -hmm. Another little nitpick, we let the last petal fall and wither before Belle says, I love you. Well, it did give us that wonderful moment at the end of the movie where all of the servants turn fully into their respective pieces. Yes, and try to manage one final action before it stops. You know, the thank yous, the I love yous. It's been an honor to work with you. Mm-hmm. And... The coat rack catching Chip before he crashes. But that wouldn't have worked if Agatha hadn't been right there. Because since it's her spell, she could still reverse it. Except we see the effects because the last petal fell. But for all we know, that was just a gauge of time. And she might have reversed it at any point. Even after the servants were fully reverted to inanimate objects, even if the beast hadn't been injured. Say five years down the road, he found love. Would she have still stepped in there and reverted everyone? Because she already stepped in after the last petal fell. Mm. Also, one of my all-time nitpicks for most of these curses, why does Belle have to say the words? Isn't it clear in her actions and what's in her heart? So wouldn't it have been triggered before she says, I love you? Mm -hmm. By the fact that she came back and says, I want to be with you, so on and so forth. I'll never leave you again. No, don't make the jump. It's too dangerous. It's okay. We're together now. I mean, just the mere fact that she came back 
because if you look at Frozen, Olaf talks about how Kristoff must really love her because he brought Anna back to the castle and left her there. And then the whole, oh, I guess he doesn't really love you because he came back. Yeah, he came back for her because he loves her. Because the rule of the curse is if the beast can learn to love another and earn their love in return. It's not tied to the magic words, I love you. Words are only words. Actions say a lot more. Mm -hmm. Kind of like in Frozen, the fact that the sister sacrifices herself to save her sister, which is the act of true love that the curse slash spell required to break. Yes. I would also bring up something about Maleficent, but Lux hasn't seen it. So for those of you who have seen Maleficent, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you for no spoilers. I try. So more or are we at the end where we wrap up all our thoughts into a tiny little package and serve it out on the internet? <laughs> we should probably wrap things up. Otherwise, I'm, I don't know, I might start singing or something. <laughs> I don't think anyone would begrudge that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. You have editing. You can auto-tune. <laughs> uh... Well, I think I'll start first with my summary. <laughs> uh, I think it's a wonderful version of the story, especially based on the Disney version of the story and not just a complete tweaking overall of the concept of a beast learning to love, skin deep kind of story about how love is deeper, important stuff is on the inside kind of story. This is a really nice version of the Disney story it's very improved in my opinion over the original and i think some people may have had trouble getting past the nostalgia of the original but i really enjoyed this piece and just the way they handled certain things the only thing that really bugged me was when i first saw the initial designs for all the servants cogsworth lumiere mrs potts but once i saw them in motion i thought they worked really well i still take slight issue with the Feather duster. I, I'm more partial to the French made design because now if you look at what Pluette's reverted form was, she almost looks more like she was one of the dancers at the ball rather than a servant. Speaking of those two, that's like how it's more of a actual love between them and not just Lumiere kind of skirt chasing. Yeah, Lumiere definitely comes off as less of a skirt chaser this time, but that might also be because Pluette comes off as less of a servant. Even though they both serve in the household, Lumiere is obviously an upper servant, where a maid would have been a lower servant. So yeah, that was my thoughts. Really enjoyed it. Very nice movie. Very well done. Yeah, it was also very fun how during the song, uh, Belle couldn't be our guest, couldn't get the food. The food kept yeah. just out of reach. She couldn't really get bites of it. I kept forgetting to bring that up. I was like, I was going to ask you, do you think she ever got anything other than the pudding? She might have gotten a bite of something, but I think she may have just had the pudding. Mm -hmm. When Belle in the original animation was able to tr actually try the gray stuff. Yes, as we see her. Also, we switched out. There were no longer beer steins singing the line of it's all in good taste that you can bet. Hmm. Though we did have those very lovely champagne glasses. Mm-hmm. That whole thing was very well done. And very fun of them trying to get the lighting to work and things just being a little off because they are losing their abilities. So the maestro having trouble playing, them having trouble with the lighting and some of the mobility. Mm hmm And how Cogsworth actually got into it by the end. <laughs> so any more? Oh, it's just very classic beauty having the beast make friends with her horse. That's Robin McKinley's beauty all over. Actually, Belle is very much Robin McKinley's beauty because she's an awkward adolescent bookworm who loves horses and reading. And she works very hard to have... Her horse, Greatheart, accepts the beast because the beast is like, no, don't ask this of your horse. He will do anything you ask of him. Don't break his heart over this. You know, showing that he cares for her even that early in their relationship in the book. As you can tell, I have to worry more about movie spoilers than book spoilers with Lux. <laughs> and here in the live action, we have her guiding Philippe to befriending the beast which i think was a lot sweeter than 
them holding out the bird seed for the wild birds. Also more realistic, the horses domesticated. And that um, brought up something I should have asked. What did you think of the casting? Overall, I enjoyed the casting. You got people who looked just similar enough for your main three, because the most important to match were Belle, the Beast, and Gaston for the nostalgia factor. I really like the updates to Maurice's design because they moved him away from crazy inventor to inspired craftsman and artisan. You know, because that made it much more difficult for everyone to accept that he was crazy. You know, he had a lot more credibility in the beginning. You know, and Gaston even going out with Maurice to look for Belle. And then only playing the crazy card later once he's run out of options. And I like how they use that crazy card, how Gaston uses it. And that's when the fact that he was accused of attempted murder really gives him the power to actually say, yeah, Maurice is crazy enough to actually start hurting people. So we need to put him away for his own safety and ours. Yes, especially because he provokes Maurice to the point of going to strike him in front of a room full of witnesses. I love our endings, don't you? <laughs> yes. Now, for real. Well, this has been our thoughts on the live-action Beauty and the Beast by Disney. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, comment, check out other videos. Uh, we do have them categorized in playlists as much as we can. We even have other Disney stuff. So, since you listen to one Disney video, why not another? You can also check out our Wednesday program, Ember's Reading Room, which is children's stories from an adult perspective. I mean, this is a classic fairy tale. You might find that interesting. If you like Lux's art, you can find more of it on Tumblr, DeviantArt, Twitter, Facebook, Google+. And, of course, on his Patreon. Remember, we are running a special promotion right now. This lovely background image, which can be yours, high res, in your choice of colors, for a $3 donation through Patreon or Coffee, that is processed by August 8, 2017. Thanks for listening.